Hello, and welcome to the APAGS Internship Workshop. This is part one of two one-hour-long sessions that are intended to walk you through the most important steps of applying for your pre-doctoral internship in psychology. My name is Carol Williams Nicholson. My colleagues, Mitch Princeton, Greg Pylan, and I have been presenting this program as part of the annual APA convention for over two decades, since the year 2000. This workshop is based on our book, Internships in Psychology, the APEGS Workbook for Writing Successful Applications and Finding the Right Fit, which is published by APA and was most recently released in its fourth edition in 2019. We encourage you to use the latest edition of the workbook in your preparations to make sure you have access to the most up-to-date information. We also want you to know that we do not personally benefit from the sales of our workbook. We donate all of the book royalties directly to APEGS to reinvest in you. We originally created this workshop to be a four-hour in-depth program that would enable us to walk applicants through the process from start to finish with our workbook providing greater detail on the major steps. In this pre-recorded format, we've been allocated two one-hour sessions for this program. So for this abbreviated time frame, we've consolidated the information that we have found to generate the most questions, to be the most nuanced, and aspects of the process that caused the most anxiety. We've made the assumption that you already know the basics about the internship process, or that you can easily find that information in our workbook. Our emphasis for parts one and two of this program is to provide tips for personalization, so you can focus on how best to present the experiences and knowledge you worked so hard to develop over your training and strategies you can use to differentiate yourself from so many other qualified candidates. With our intention to offer practical advice, our agenda for part one will cover APIC's role and the use of the API tools to start the process, identifying training goals, writing effective cover letters, and obtaining helpful letters of recommendation. Part two will focus on developing compelling essays, preparing for interviews, and the match. Since you're able to pause the recordings and refer back to the workbook, we'll move through topics quickly, and our focus will be on universal strategies that are relevant to the majority of applicants. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce you to my colleagues and myself. Mitch Princeton has a long academic leadership career as a professor, assistant dean, Director of Graduate Studies in Clinical Psychology, as well as Training Director at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at Yale University. Mitch is a past president of the Society of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology and the Society for the Science of Clinical Psychology. He's an APA journal editor, the author of several child and adolescent psychology textbooks, and recently he authored the book, Popular, The Power of Likeability in a Status-Obsessed World. Mitch is also a current member of the APA Board of Directors. Greg Kylan is the former Assistant Director and Training Director at the University of Texas Austin Community Mental Health and Counseling Center. He's been involved with APIC for over 30 years, serving as the Chair of APIC in several other pivotal roles, where he revolutionized the entire internship application and match process. Greg oversaw the design and implementation of the API and Computer Match over 20 years ago and remains the match coordinator to this day. He currently consults with internship programs and APIC. And again, I'm Carol. My background includes clinical work in behavioral health, medical, and counseling centers. I was the first executive director for APAGS. I was the chief executive for the American Medical Student Association and Foundation, and I was the CEO for a test development and certification organization. Currently, I'm a principal consultant for a firm that advises regulated business, finance, and healthcare industries on behavioral health program and service delivery. And I'm currently a clinician and a member of the senior leadership team at a large multi-office mental health practice. What the three of us have in common is a strong and enduring commitment to help support and build competent and successful future psychologists. Working with graduate students has always been a passion for each of us, and our goal for this workshop and our workbook is to help you have the best training experience possible. Since this presentation does, format doesn't allow for questions, our contact information is on this slide. Next, Greg is going to get us started by talking about APIC and beginning the internship application process. 
Hello everybody, I am Greg Kylan. I'm the APIC Match Coordinator. Very happy to be here with you today in this crazy format during crazy times. Uh, I'd like to talk with you first about uh, getting started. I have a number of topics to discuss with you about getting things going and I'll also give you an overview of the Appy Online service as part of that. So let's jump right in. So let's begin by talking about, well, the obvious elephant in the room, which is what does it mean to apply for internship during a pandemic? So I have a few things I want to tell you about that. First of all, you should know that sites have been asked by APIC not to hold on-site interviews. Now that's a request from APIC, not a requirement, so a few stragglers may still require an on-site interview. The vast majority will, will not and will be interviewing, say, via video or telephone or something like that. Now that's a major, major change. Um, the good news is that it will save you a lot of money because you won't be traveling around the country. But the hard part is that it means that you will be missing out on a very important source of information, which is the ability to actually see a site uh, from you know being at that site and being able to see uh, the facility and meet the people and those kinds of things. Now we hope that some sites will creatively develop materials like tours or other kinds of videos that will help students get a, an understanding of what it's like to be at their site but you will still need to ask questions and uh, it's going to be important for you to really put yourself out there and ask questions to make sure you understand what you need to understand in order to make your own ranking decisions and I'll talk a little bit more about those questions in just a minute Another thing to understand is that some sites consider interns to be what's called essential employees, which is broadly defined as someone who's required to work during a closure or an emergency situation or something similar, even in situations where most of the agency staff uh, are sent home. So some sites consider medical staff, psychologists, and even psychology interns as essential employees and require them to report to work in these situations. Now, people are going to naturally differ on their comfort with this. There are some people that will be okay with it, that feel that it's an important part of being a psychologist or a psychology intern. Uh, and will will feel that commitment to clients and patients, that's totally fine. On the other hand, there are people that will feel concerned about their safety or safety of people that they live with or care for and will be very hesitant to be in such a role. That is totally fine as well. So there's no right answer to that. But what is important is you need to be clear about your own willingness to serve in that role as you're evaluating sites and really not apply to sites where you may be put in a position that is not acceptable to you. Now sites have been asked to clarify whether psychology interns are considered essential, um, but that's going to vary. That definition is going to vary a lot from site to site, and so uh, asking questions about that is going to be very important. And speaking of questions, do not be hesitant to ask questions during this process. There's a lot to ask about anyway, even more so uh, in the midst of a pandemic. So it is really okay to reach out to sites and ask questions uh, before you apply. You don't have to wait to the interview for that. If you have questions that may affect your interest in applying to a site, such as safety related issues, it's really fine to reach out and ask if the site's materials don't answer your questions to your satisfaction. It's also okay to reach out anytime, whether it's after the interview or at other times if you have questions. There are sometimes rumors that you're not allowed to do that. That's just not true. You can reach out to sites at any time to get your questions answered. You should also understand that, of course, this is a time of much uncertainty. Nobody knows what things are going to look like when you begin your internship a year from now. So in many cases, sites will not have definitive answers. So you are going to have to tolerate that ambiguity. And at the same time, as I said, you don't want to be matched to a site which you don't feel okay in attending. So don't rank a site that you don't want to be matched to. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the match later on in this presentation. In terms of questions to ask, there's lots and lots of questions, of course, 
just in the course of this process, but given the pandemic, I think there are two major issues uh, that I think about. One is questions about safety. What kinds of changes to the work environment have happened? And I have a couple of examples of questions here or topics that you might ask about that might relate to your own personal safety in being an intern. And a second area is the impact on the training program and the interns experiences. Virtually all training programs have had to make some adjustments in their training program. Uh, often it involves working from home and telehealth and all kinds of other things. I've listed here some examples of some questions or some areas in which you might ask about. And, and again, don't be afraid to ask about, you know, what have you seen as the advantages and the disadvantages of the changes and what has this been like for the interns and, and those kinds of questions, all absolutely appropriate to ask. And finally, in this sort of broad area, one of the things that I think uh, students are concerned about is some have experienced an interruption in the, in the accrual of their practicum hours and that their practicum experiences may have been canceled this year, may have shifted to telehealth or other kinds of approaches and ways which may have affected the hours that they're going to be reporting. So a few things you should know about that. APIC has informed internship sites about this issue and how it's affected many students and to, to be sensitive to that. You should also know that selection committees really I mean, hours are a piece of the equation, but they're relatively low importance compared to a lot of other things in your application. So small variances in hours are really not going to make a lot of difference. You should also know that APIC now allows telephone-based mental health services to be included on the API as of March of this year. And the APIC website has, uh, and the API section has a lot more information about that. And finally, it is really okay to use your cover letter to describe your situation. So if you had a particular practicum experience that was affected by the pandemic and there's something about that that you want to communicate to internship sites or how that affected your hours or something like that, um, it is absolutely okay to use your cover letter for that purpose. Now, I, I wouldn't feel obligated to do that. You can certainly consult with your DCT about whether that's even necessary to do. But if your situation, if you feel like it would be helpful to communicate that to, to, to um, sites, you can do that in your cover letter. And there are also places on the API where you can do that as well. Okay, moving on to internship supply and demand. Um, this is been something that I'm sure you've heard about over the years. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Very briefly, this is a 22-year chart with the blue line being the number of applicants each year and the red line being the number of positions each year. And as you can see, we went through some very difficult times. The worst was in 2012, but now things are really nicely balanced between applicants and positions and have been for the last couple of years. Um, I also want to show you um, a different version of this slide. And what I've done here is I've added an orange line which indicates the number of accredited internship positions each year. And as you can see, in 2012, it was pretty awful, the shortage of accredited positions. But we have seen great improvements since then. And now we're at the point where the difference between the number of applicants and the number of accredited positions is about 400, which means that there is an accredited position for about 90% of all applicants. Okay, let's talk a little bit about accreditation and APIC membership, which are important topics uh, and concepts to understand. First of all, accreditation. Accreditation is only provided by two organizations, the American Psychological Association for US-based internship sites and the Cana Canadian Psychological Association for Canadian-based sites. Those are really the only two organizations that matter when it comes to psychology accreditation of internship programs. If a program, an internship program has been accredited, you know that they have reached the highest standard that our profession provides. And you can be fairly certain that no one down the road is going to question the quality of your internship experience. Now a second concept is APIC membership. APIC is not an accrediting body. 
So the term, if you if you see the term APIC accredited anywhere, that's really not the right term to use. It's APIC membership. APIC has membership criteria that internships have to meet that demonstrate quality training um, in order to become members. However, APIC's criteria is not as stringent as accreditation criteria, and the review process is not nearly as intense or as comprehensive. So while going to an APIC member program can be uh, certainly a sign of program quality, accreditation is um, the highest standard in that regard, and that is an important difference to understand. Now, as far as the match is concerned, the match includes only APIC member internship programs. In previous years, non-members were allowed non-APIC member internships. That is not true as of this year. So we have about 790 programs that will be in this year's match. About 690 are accredited, and they're also APIC members. And 100 are APIC members that are not accredited. And as you go through the directory and as you go through uh, other materials, you will see these programs designated in terms of their membership status and their accreditation status. Now, if you are considering attending a non-accredited internship, it's really important that you understand the potential impact on licensure and on future employment. So one example is employment at a VA or even at many other federal positions. Those often require, and the VA does require, an accredited internship and doctoral program. So if you choose a non-accredited internship, you cannot be employed as a psychologist by the VA. It's also true for many jobs and postdocs. If you go through listings of jobs and postdocs, you will see that many prefer or require accreditation. So it's something to pay attention to. You should also know that the profession is moving towards universal accreditation, which means that the intention is that down the road, every doctoral program and every internship will be accredited. So that's an important piece of this as well. If you're thinking about going the non-accredited route, remember that you cannot change your mind down the road. In other words, you really can't do a second internship. And finally, if you get advice from someone who says, don't worry about it, it doesn't matter if your internship is accredited or not, I would seek another source of mentorship because that is not accurate information, in my opinion. For most people, it does matter and it is important, something to pay attention to. So let's talk a little bit about how to find internship sites. Probably the primary way to do that is through the APIC directory on the APIC website. There are a variety of search options and in fact you should make sure that you have clicked on the little button that opens up all the extra search options because they're kind of hidden unless you actually um, look for them. But the APIC directory is, provides summary information for each program, and then it provides links to the program's websites where you can find more comprehensive information. You can also ask faculty, your faculty, fellow students, maybe who are a year or two ahead of you, about uh, internships that they found or internships that they know of that, that provide good training experiences. They are also a really good source of information. You should pay close attention to site's application requirements and preferences. If you apply to a site where you don't meet their minimum requirements, it's going to be a big waste of money. And you should develop a system to keep track of those requirements as well as application deadlines, interview notification dates, and related things. Deciding where to apply. Now this first point is one of the most important things that I'm going to say to you today which is, it is very important for you to choose site at which you are a good fit, which means that your background and your experiences and your interests match well with what a site has to offer. That is a very, very important thing for internship sites. And even if you are the best applicant on the planet, and have an amazing application, if sites don't consider that you're, going, that you're a good fit, they're going to think that you're not going to be happy there and they're going to be very hesitant to interview you or to rank you. So you really do want to choose sites at which you're a good fit. Now, if you have an interest in a site which is somewhat of a different direction for you, 
where it looks like you're doing something very different maybe than you've been doing in the past. That is okay to do, but remember that the bar is going to be higher for that site and you're really going to have to make a great case in your cover letter as to why you are a good fit. So, um, so really when you think about where to apply this whole issue of fit is extremely important as I said. Another thing to consider is basically don't apply to all highly competitive sites because doing so is a recipe for not being matched no matter how good you are or how good your application is. You should also consider sites at which others from your program have done well if those sites are a good fit for you. Very often internship programs develop these sort of informal relationships with doctoral programs. Like if they've gotten good interns from a particular doctoral program, they will look favorably upon that program and its applicants and its students in future years. So if you come from one of those doctoral programs, you might consider the internship at which your um, students from your program have done well. Try not to apply to a limited geographic area, and this ha goes back to the fit issue. If you think about it, by definition, if you apply to all sites in your local area, many of them are probably not going to be good fits, and it's going to be an uphill battle for you to be able to uh, get interviewed at those sites. So, um, so try not to do that. Um, I do recognize that there are people that are geographically restricted for many uh, very, very valid reasons, and this can then can pose a particular challenge. But in general, focusing more on fit rather than geography is a better recipe for getting matched. And finally, a somewhat related issue to all of this is about criminal background checks and drug testing, which is a requirement that uh, some internship programs have. Those programs are required to disclose that in advance on their website or in the directory. Um, and if you are someone who has a not perfect criminal record, or if you use drugs legally or illegally, this is something that you really want to pay attention to. And, and a again, ask questions. You can call the site. You can call the site's HR department if you want. Um, one of the things that we've had some people get into trouble with is making the assumption that just because marijuana is legal to use in their jurisdiction and maybe they have a prescription for it, it still may not be legal in the jurisdiction where the internship site is located or it may simply be not okay with the internship site, prescription or no prescription, legality or illegal. So something to pay attention to if this is something um, that that affects you. Okay, moving on to the topic of how many applications you should submit. This is uh, what what we recommend. This bar graph shows you the relationship between the number of applications that you submit and the likelihood of being matched. So that left blue bar basically says that if you submit between one and five applications you have an 80 percent chance of being matched. Now you can see as you submit more applications your chances do improve but there's an upper limit to that and what this data shows is that if you submit more than 15 applications uh, it does not increase the, the likelihood of your being matched. So now I will uh, for a caveat here for Canadian applicants, these actually these numbers look a little bit different but for US applicants this has been a very very consistent finding year after year after year. 11 to 15 applications seems to be the sweet spot where it's enough to maximize the likelihood of your being matched but not overdoing it, uh, which is what submitting more than 15 applicants would, would be for most applicants. Just a And this slide shows something very similar but the match rate for being matched to an accredited internship. And as you can see, it gives you the exact same result, which is 11 to 15 applications is really the sweet spot for virtually all applicants. Now let's talk briefly about your support system. This is not a process you should be doing on your own. Ask faculty for support. 
Hopefully they are doing that already of their own initiative, but if they aren't, you should definitely ask them. Get people to read your application, your essays, provide feedback. Very, very important for you to do. I also recommend a support group with other students. Talk openly about the competition. Uh, you will likely be applying to some of the same sites as some of your good friends. You might as well talk about that. Um, and also get feedback on your interviewing skills. One of the things I learned as a training director when I was doing interviews is that being a terrific graduate student or a great clinician does not make you a great interviewee. They are different skills and some excellent students do not interview well. And so I think it's really worth your time to get feedback, do mock interviews um, before you actually participate in real ones. Before we move on to the appy, I just want to give you my contact information. I welcome questions, phone calls, emails. Uh, you're always welcome to contact me. Okay, let's move on to the Appy Online Service. This is APIC's application service, a standardized application service. And I'm going to go over uh, the basics for you. So let me begin with a word of advice, which is don't freak out about your practicum hours. Many students spend many hours worrying about not having enough practicum hours. And quite honestly, hours are simply not a high priority for most training directors. Uh, the medians from 2019 for intervention and assessment hours are on the screen. If you have somewhere plus or minus in that kind of ballpark, you are fine. Give you a step-by-step -step overview of the process of submitting applications. First of all, you create an Appy Online account. And, by the way, you can create a fake account, a test account, um, just to see if it works. Or just to play with it a little bit before you create a real account. That's totally fine to do. You submit your graduate transcripts to the Appy Online service. You decide who to ask for letters of reference. You develop your application. You submit it uh, once completed to your director of clinical training who will review it and verify it. And that process actually locks it so you can't make any further changes. You then finalize the list of sites to which you will apply called designations and at that point when you're ready su to submit you do so and at that time is when you pay the fee. So there's no fee until you actually submit applications. Talk a little bit about graduate transcripts. You need to submit official copies of all graduate transcripts even if you didn't receive a degree from a particular particular program that you attended. There is a transcript request form that you can download and give to your registrar and I really advise you not to wait until the last minute to submit your transcripts because they can take quite a while to process. And the good thing about having your graduate transcripts handled in this way is that you only have to submit one copy, one official copy, and then that is scanned and distributed to all the internship sites to which you apply. So it's quite a money saver. Do not submit undergraduate transcripts, and I already said that part. Letters of reference. So what you do with letters is you use the Appy Online to send an electronic request to each reference. So basically you uh, go in, you enter the email address and the name of the person who is going to write a reference for you. They receive the notification through email. They upload the letter. You are notified when the letter has been uploaded, but you cannot actually view that letter. Now the reference can show you the letter if he or she wishes to do that. It's totally up to them, but you cannot view any of your letters through the Appy Online service. But you can see when they are uploaded and ready to go. You can request multiple letters from one person, and sometimes you might want that, for example, if you're applying to a couple different kinds of sites, and you want that a letter from that person to reflect different things depending on which site you're applying to. So that's fine to do, but I would encourage you to be courteous and to ask uh, that person about the possibility of writing two different letters uh, before you actually send them a request to do so. And when you submit your application, you designate which letters you are going to attach to each application, so it's perfectly okay to send different letters to different programs. Most people don't need to do that, but again, it is an option. 
categorizing your hours. Now, as most of you probably know, the Appy Online focuses on practicum hours and not work experience hours. And you will be asked to categorize your practicum experience a billion different ways. And I'm sure many of you have already been doing that in time to track or whatever uh, uh, spreadsheet or process you're using to record your hours. Often there is no right answer to how certain hours should be categorized. So if you're not sure, here is how I recommend you approach it, which is simply be honest, be reasonable, consult the instructions, which are on every page of the Appy, use your best judgment, if you are in doubt, consult with your director of, tr of clinical training as they have been empowered by APIC to make the decision as to what should or should not be recorded on the appy or what categories that kind of thing if you're still in doubt or if your dct doesn't know you're welcome to contact the appy online coordinator dr kimberly hill and i'll give you her contact information at the end of this section cover letters uh, you'll hear more about cover letters in another part of this presentation but you should know at this point that each cover letter should be tailored to each internship program and I mentioned fit earlier and this is the place where you really want to describe the fit between you and the program and I really encourage you not to be generic do not write a single letter that you're going to send to multiple sites because I promise you they will be able to tell that you did that and it will not reflect well on your application there's also um, four essays 500 words each you upload them as sets of essays and you can upload different sets if you want to do that again most students just use one set same four essays but if you want to send different essays to different sites that is totally fine to do I'm often asked is it okay to exceed the 500 word limit and while nobody is counting every word um, it really is uh, important to stick to that 500 word limit with your uh, Vita, you can upload as many versions as you like. Same thing here. Most go with one. Most students just need one, but you can use different versions if you would like to do so. And finally, there's this thing called supplemental materials, which is a unique site requirement. There are certain sites, not a lot, but some that require extra materials. And APIC policies limits these requests to only two things, either a treatment or case summary or a psychological evaluation report. Uh, sites are not allowed to ask for anything else. And please, if you upload any supplemental materials, make sure you de-identify them because it's a big problem if you uh, fail to do that. Now, I mentioned there's a process called uh, DCT verification. So when you are done with the, the core part of the Appy Online of your application, you submit it to your DCT. That portion is then locked, and your DCT is required to verify portions of your application prior to any submission. So the DCT verifies what's called the Summary of Doctoral Training section, and you should proofread everything, and I can't emphasize that enough. Be sure that the information is accurate prior to submitting it to your DCT. The main sections of your app, as I said, are locked upon submission and cannot be unlocked later on. So make sure you proofread in advance. When you submit your application for DCT verification, the DCT receives an email. They uh, review the sections of your application. They're asked to provide evaluative information, indications that you're ready for internship, those kinds of things. And if the DCT approves all that you did in your part, um, they will approve it. The sections remain locked. If the DCT wants you to change something, if they don't approve it, it is all sent back to you and those sections are then on unlocked so you can modify them and then resubmit them to the DCT for verification again. Submitting applications to programs. So I'm, you remember I mentioned the term designation simply means an internship program. So you will be asked uh, fairly early on in the process to designate the internship programs to wish, which you wish to submit applications and you can change those at any time. When you do that, you're asked to indicate which items to send to which site. So you indicate which cover letter goes to the site, which letters of reference, which set of essays, etc. 
you can submit any time after October 1st. Now you can log into the Appy Online as soon as it opens, in, which is usually in July or early August, um, and you can begin you know, working on your, your applications, but you can't actually submit to sites until after October 1st. For sites that have multiple tracks, for example, maybe a site that has an adult rotation and a child rotation, you will be required to specify which tracks you wish to apply for. So you could say, I'd like to apply to the adult track or to the child track or to both. Totally up to you. Uh, you can view how your application will look to the site before you submit it and you can submit different applications at different times. In other words, they don't have to all go in at the same time. And finally, here are the fees for submission. It is not an inexpensive process. Of course, you are saving money compared to previous ways of doing this where you would have FedEx costs and you would have to pay for maybe 15 official transcripts and things like that, but it is an expensive process and you will notice that APIC really doesn't want you to submit more than 15 applications based on the data that I presented earlier and so there's also a financial disincentive for doing so. And that wraps up this section. Uh, here is some information about the Appy Online Help Center, where instructions are. There's the contact information for the Appy Online Coordinator, Dr. Kimberly Hill. Um, now she is uh, she's going to answer questions about content, but if you have technical problems such as transcripts, you can't log in. Uh, technical support kinds of things that needs to go through their customer service and they're available weekdays uh, at the contacts uh, shown there and so we will now uh, move on to the next section Hi, I'm Mitch Princeton, and I'm going to talk with you about getting started on the internship application process. So a lot of people have a temptation to jump right in and start looking at sites and start thinking about getting their CV together and their hours and writing essays, but I don't think that's the best way to go. I think instead what I'd like to ask you to do just for a minute or two right now is to go ahead and think back to the time that you first found out that you got into a doctoral program in clinical counseling or school psychology. Try and remember the email or the phone call that you got that told you that your dreams were being fulfilled, you were in fact getting into a doctoral program and you were gonna be a psychologist. And the reason why I'm asking you to think about that is I want you to try and recapture for a second what it is that you thought you might do once you graduated, you were finished with school. Did you imagine you'd be a professor? Did you think that maybe you'd do a private practice, uh, maybe work in a liberal arts setting as an educator? Whatever it was, you probably at that point had a bit of a clearer picture than you might have now on what it is that you wanted to do once you got your degree. The reason why I think it's a good idea to kind of think back a little bit to that time is because for a lot of people, graduate school kind of, you know, stomps on and crushes all those dreams while you're thinking about all of your hurdles that you have to get through, your master's thesis and your comps or your quals, your dissertation, each client, the notes you have to write. It's really hard to kind of stop and take stock and think a little bit about what all of this is for. What is the future that you're imagining? I think that's important to do, especially as we begin the internship application process, because what I'm gonna talk about in this particular video is the way in which you can approach the internship application process to meet very specific training goals. And those training goals are gonna guide you through the entire process, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later but they really should be based on some sort of vision, a five-year or 10-year vision of where you think you might be. So that way we can figure out what skills you need in this last perhaps formal training experience 
internship before you are off to function into independently um, for the rest of your career. Of course, you might get some training experiences here and there, but this is the last time when you have access to a broad range of possible supervisors or training experiences. So we want to make sure that we're thinking about your goals very specifically. What are the skills that you need in order to be successful and be on the right path for what that career might be? So when it comes to thinking about career paths, it is true that most graduate students at this stage of the game, five, six years into graduate training, might still not know what it is that they wanna do. And that's totally okay. That's really normal. In fact, it's usually the case that people have an easier time ruling things out rather than knowing exactly what path that they want. So for instance, you might have decided that you have no interest in doing any statistics or research the minute you defend your dissertation, and that's okay. For some of you, it might be the other case that you like clinical work and it forms some of the research that you do, but you really would not like to do a whole lot of clinical work even after you do a full-time clinical internship. And still for others, there might be an interest in consulting or teaching or other activities you can engage in with your degree. So you're not necessarily uh, sure what you're gonna do, but you know what you're not gonna do. The first step I think is to think a little bit about that and get a sense of what might be possible because what it is that you might do career-wise might inform some of those internship goals. For instance, if you were gonna be at a liberal arts college and you were gonna be an instructor for psychology, then you might be the only clinical counseling or school psychologist on the entire campus. So it's gonna be important for you to have breadth on internship. You're gonna to wanna to know a little bit about everything in the DSM and all of the different ways that psych services are provided, let's say. That way you have an opportunity to talk about that to the students in your department. Let's say that you wanna go into a research career, maybe a traditional tenure track kind of path. Well, there's probably gonna be an area, maybe even an area of psychopathology that you're gonna be focusing on. So on internship, you might wanna see what that type of psychopathology looks like in all of its comorbid presentations and with all ranges of severity, outpatient, inpatient, partial, and that might inform some of your internship goals. Whatever it is, it's important to really think about that and to understand how internship can be the bridge between what it is you know now and what it is that you hope to be able to do on your own um, by the time you finish this one full-time year. So this is gonna lead to a set of internship goals. And I don't mean that in the kind of Tony Robbins, you know, way to make this seem like a, a silly exercise or, you know, some motivational process. I'll tell you a little bit more about the ways that the goals are actually gonna make the whole rest of the process easier and make you come across as focused and thoughtful throughout this process. In fact, I think that the goals is are a secret ingredient that you can really use to take away a lot of stress and take an overwhelming amount of information and decisions to make and make it in, uh, make this process something that is much more tolerable and organized for you. In fact, uh, goals have become something so commonplace in the way that internship directors think about your experiences now that you will be asked about them quite explicitly, even on interviews. Um, and as you're making decisions. So it's probably a good way that we think about that. And again, map them on to possible, maybe long-term career plans. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and I'm gonna specifically focus first on the ways that we should be thinking about what these goals are. And the first thing that I wanna say that I think is particularly important is that you wanna make sure that you're coming up with three, maybe four or five goals or so, we'll talk about that more later, that are kind of unique to you. Now, it's not the case that every one of those goals is gonna be highly specific and unique, but certainly it's gonna be a goal that in combination with the others will really make you stand out from the other, uh, the other applicants. Because if what you're looking for on internship is the exact same thing that all 4,000 of the other applicants are looking for on internship, then it'll be hard to really argue why you are a fit to that particular site or for that site to get a sense of why are their resources a good fit for you and not for everyone else that's out there. So thinking about goals and making them really specific is important. So that way it promotes a sense of fit 
for you and also for the site. So they can be rooting for you in this process and say, you know, what they want is exactly the kind of thing that we offer and we have just, we're so well aligned with them on their needs that we can't help but give them an interview. You know, that's the kind of thing that you want to promote in the way that people are reading your application, that they really see that lining up well. I'll also say briefly that when it comes to thinking about goals, you do want to come up with about three to five or so goals. You do not want to have three separate goals for each of the 12, 13, or 15 sites that you're applying to. That would not only be madness making for you, but obviously it would be disingenuous, which comes across to the site and also is going to lead to a not so good experience for you. Okay, so when you're thinking about goals, I want you to think about these three questions, and I'll tell you a little bit about the ways in which you can get answers to them as well. This is all in the workbook, so you can absolutely go and check that out and get more information. But for instance, you would say something like, given my accrued experiences and the areas of emerging competency that I have so far, what are the most essential experiences that I need to become a blank private practitioner? working in a hospital setting, working at a VA. You might discover that you need to learn a lot more about working with vets or understanding substance use treatment or trauma. You might realize that you need to know more about inpatient unit experience or family therapy. Maybe something that you need to learn that you're feeling okay on, but you really couldn't do it autonomously yet. So that's something that would, that would guide you in terms of making a goal. Here's another way of going about it. By the time I'm a licensed independent psychologist, I'd like to feel that I'm competent and autonomous in blank. What skill? You know, there are probably a few things that you feel that way about right now. Like some graduate students feel that they could administer a WACE or a WISC and they could score it and interpret it and write up a report on it and do that pretty much with minimal supervision. That's okay if that's not your thing. Everyone has something different. You might feel that you can do an intake session or you can walk through CBT for, let's say, an exposure exercise. Whatever it is, you probably have a few things that you're feeling that way about right now. The question is, what are some things that you feel that you kind of need some more supervision and you want to get to that point um, so you can do it autonomously? And then that would be something that you're going to focus on here. Third, I could probably function independently in a few areas, but I feel like I should get more experience doing what in order to feel confident as a psychologist. Now, when you answer these questions, you shouldn't necessarily be doing it alone. These are things that you can think about by reviewing your CV and the different rotations and experiences that you've had. But you should also be talking directly with your supervisors and asking them these same questions to get feedback on what they think you need a little bit more training in. And that's okay to ask. You're applying for a training experience, not a job. So it's okay to talk about with your supervisors who will write you letters and also in your essays, which we'll talk about later, um, exactly what things you need more training in. You're not fully competent in yet. That's okay. The other thing you want to do is talk with your supervisors, maybe even the director of the training program that you're in, about areas that you simply did not get a lot of exposure in because that's just not something your program offers. Maybe your program doesn't have opportunities for work in a hospital or in a counseling center. Maybe you haven't had a chance to do community-based work or forensic work, neuropsych work. And your program director can tell you about things they know are out there that maybe you haven't been exposed to yet. Just as a nature of the program and what its emphases are. And that might give you ideas for goals as well, for things that you're interested in. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a few examples of unique and specific training goals. And note here that these do seem like they're relatively specific, um, especially if you had three or four of these, um, three of them that you were expressing in an essay, that it would be very unlikely that someone would have the exact same three that you would have. For instance, I'd like to get more experience with behavioral treatments for ADHD. I'd like more exposure to severe psychopathology, including psychopathy in a forensic setting, nice and specific. I'd like to get more experience conducting family therapy or maybe group therapy or maybe a certain assessment approach. 
I'd like to conduct research while on internship and be exposed to scientist practitioner careers. This one makes perfect sense. There are plenty of sites out there that will offer you a half day or even a full day of time dedicated to research. And if that's a fit for you, it's good to mention that that's something you want on internship. I'd like to learn more about a counseling center environment, develop expertise with young adults adjustment difficulties. I'd like to establish a career and professional network in the Anchorage area. Let me say a quick word on that. It is totally okay to talk about geography as being one of the things that's guiding you. I probably wouldn't put it as my number one goal. I might mention it after I've really emphasized my professional training goals, but it's totally appropriate and okay to say that establishing a network and starting to blend your personal and your professional goals together is an important thing at this step of your career. Of course it is. Everyone knows that you have both a personal life and a professional life and starting to get to an area where you can put down roots is totally appropriate as long as it's in proportion to other things that you're wanting on internship as well. I think if you led with that and talked only about geography, then a site would not think that they're a fit to you on anything other than where they're located, which is not a good way to do it. I would like to go to a site that will allow for postdoctoral training. Yeah, it's true, you're gonna to get to internship and within like a month, you're gonna start applying for postdocs. So if for you, it's important to kind of remain stable for a few years, that's also a perfectly appropriate goal to mention. Okay, I wanna give you a few examples now of some goals that I think are fine if that's how you're feeling. I just don't know that this is what I would express on the application or in an interview, because as you'll see, this kind of describes everybody and every internship in such a way where it would be hard for the site to really feel compelled to interview you, very excited about the fit, if you're saying something that kind of all 4,000 people would also be able to say. So for instance, I would like to conduct outpatient treatment with adults. You're probably gonna get that on just about every single adult internship. So this doesn't differentiate the site or you. I'd like to attend a prestigious site. A lot of people write this when they're applying to places that have good reputations. And it's a nice thing to say, but just think about it for a second from the perspective of the site. They probably are aware that folks regard their site as having a high reputation. So for you to say that you're, what you're interested in is that kind of prestige on your CV, that's nice flattery, but it doesn't really have the function that you're probably attempting to convey or for that to serve. You know, you want to be able to fit with them because what they offer fits your training goals. It provides you with experiences you need for your path. And just because it's gonna look good on your CV, that's not something that should be one of your goals. And that's not something that's gonna make them feel that they need to interview you because probably a lot of people are saying that or thinking that, and it doesn't make you stand out to them because you've said it in your essays. I'd like to become competent in the area of assessment. That's a perfectly fine thing if that's what you want, but can you be a little bit more specific? What type of assessment, what type of population perhaps that would help? I hope to enjoy uh, my experience by working in many different areas, or I'm excited for a large range of possibilities. Again, this is kind of a little bit like dating. You don't wanna to seem too desperate and say, whatever it is that you offer, I'll be okay with it. I think it's important to remember that you provide many assets and competencies in this process, and you are bringing something to that internship site. So there surely is something about what that site is offering that's of more interest to you than some of the other things. Even if you genuinely are interested in everything that it says on their website, try and be a little bit choosy, a little discerning, and a little bit thoughtful in that there are some experiences that would be a better fit to you than others. Try not to sound too desperate when you're talking about your goals. So as I mentioned before, it's probably a good idea to articulate three goals but it might be that your top three goals do not fit an entire list of 12 to 15 sites. So it's okay if you have secret goal number four, secret goal number five, and for some internships, you're gonna talk about goals one, two, and three. Maybe that fits, let's say, VAs or counseling centers or major, med major medical centers, but it might be that you also apply to a different group of sites. And for them, you're gonna talk about goals one, two, and five, or two, three, and four, or something like that. When we talk a little bit later about essays, I'll tell you about how to do that in a way where you can modular, kind of talk about your goals and just take out a paragraph, 
put back in a different paragraph for those goals. But the key thing here is that those goals are things, all five of them, are things you're genuinely interested in. Um, you are truly conveying with sincerity things that you really want to do. So if you end up matching to a site that has goals three, four, and five, you will be very happy, even if you didn't get goals one and two, because all five of those things are things that you need to get to the career that you think is on your list as still possible for your career direction. Now, the goals can actually also provide you some structure to get through the entire process. Some people will use those goals to actually rank each site, to rate each site, excuse me, as they're going through the APIC directory to really help them sort out which things they want more than others. And I should mention that the process of looking through the directory and establishing your goals is an iterative process. So you might come up with some goals then read some websites about training sites and say, wow, that's an experience I didn't even know. I think I want to make that a goal. And you might revise your goals and so on and so forth. So it's okay if this process is kind of something that is informing one another, but at the end, you will hopefully have a list of sites at this stage of the game, often you'll have a list of 20 sites or so. Trust me, there will be some attrition at the final stage of writing your cover letters, so you will get that down to 15 or less by the time um, November 1 comes around. Um, but all of those sites on your list are going to be rated high on at least three of your top three to five goals or so. You will definitely talk about these goals quite explicitly in your essays, and we'll talk about that more soon. You will be asked on many interviews to articulate what these goals are and how you came to them. So the more thinking that you do now, the more prepared you are for interviews. So right now, before you jump into doing your CV or calculating your hours or anything like that, I think it will be good um, to spend a lot of time, time while you're exercising, while you're driving, while you're quarantining, whatever it is, just thinking. That's the best way to get started on this process because the more clearly you can tell the story about what goals you have and why you have these goals, the better you are gonna fare through the entire process. In my opinion, getting an internship match on match day is a terrific outcome for this process. And it is more and more likely that the majority of you are not only going to have one of those uh, a match, but probably to your first choice or first three choices. The better part of this process that I think is to think about it as the one time you've had for years to really learn who you are in, as a psychologist. What makes you unique? What are the things that you want and what are the skills you'll get to get to that destination? If you can do that through this process, if you can use this as a professional development exercise to reflect and to really understand what it is you want to do in the field, that is going to outlive your internship year entirely. That is a benefit of this process that is going to serve you for years and years to come. So for me, setting goals is a really important way to start for exactly that reason. This is the time to really reflect, to think about all of the pracs you've had, to understand what is it about those pracs that I liked and did not. What are the things that I brought to each one of those experiences and how does that shape the psychologist that I am becoming today? Because that's exactly what you're going to articulate on all of your interviews and in each of your essays. When you get back from all those interviews, you might also use these goals as a way to help rank your sites and really get back to a grounded sense of there were lots of fun things that you saw and heard about and lots of people that you talked to. But at the end of the day, which of those sites are going to help you with your training goals? So hopefully this exercise of thinking about goals in this way is going to really serve you for the entire next nine months or so of this process as you go through each step along the way. I hope this has been helpful. I will see you again when we talk about essays. Good luck. Hello again, everyone. This is Carol, and I'm now going to talk about cover letters and strategies for obtaining strong recommendation letters. Without question, there's no better way to rehearse for your future job search than by carefully preparing, applying, and interviewing for internship. It's important to recognize that no one part of the API or materials you submit 
are more important than the other. The API and application process is designed to get as complete a picture as possible of who you are. So you should think about the order in which your materials will be viewed and how they will affect your advancement to the next stages of the evaluation process. The quality of your cover letter is very important because it's often what training directors will read first. It introduces you and your application to the reviewers and prepares them for everything that follows. Your letter will either entice them to want to learn more about you, or it will prompt them to move your file to their do not proceed folder. So how do you write an attention getting cover letter and convince the reader to want to learn more about you? First, think about how you can distinguish yourself as a top candidate, especially when a site may be more competitive based on the high ratio of applicants to only a few internship positions. Be sure you're concise and deliberate with every word you use. Obviously, your letter shouldn't have any spelling or grammar errors, and it needs to read in a logical flowing sequence. Apart from precision, it needs to be compelling, which is accomplished through personalization and customizing each letter to each site. Use your cover letter to connect with the reviewer. Be sure that you illustrate that you're familiar with the site and give a high level overview of how your skills and needs match the training offered. Explain what's special about you and be very focused and intentional with what you say. How do you build anticipation and hook the reader? Whatever you do, don't make the reviewer have to work hard to figure out if they should interview you or think, I don't get it. Why are they applying to my site? Nothing in this letter sounds relevant to the training we offer. By the end of reading your cover letter, you want them to be excited and think, this is someone I really want to meet. The question you're asked to respond to in your cover letter is, how do you envision our internship site meeting your training goals and interests? This is both an invitation and a mandate to address site-specific issues and training opportunities. And you can only do this by writing a custom letter for each site. Your letter should be one, but no more than two pages. You can't upload more than 100 unique letters, but you probably never want to do that anyway. And you can save each letter with a title for each site. Now I want to share some ideas for structuring your letter. Start with a brief opening. Immediately state why you're writing and the slot or rotation you're seeking, then move on and get right to your skills and goals. Briefly identify your top goals, highlight your skills and experience through examples, and succinctly explain how your interests fit with the site's opportunities. Ask yourself what interests you in the site and why you'd be a great intern, and then clearly explain that relationship. Be sure to mention specific projects, research, or experiences you've had that correspond to the site's offerings. And remember to connect the dots for the reader so you make sense to them as an applicant and they can immediately envision you at their site and really get excited about the chance to help you advance your skills. Here's an example of how you might accomplish the goals of your cover letter. With excitement and anticipation, I've watched the opportunities at your site grow since it became APA accredited in 2014. I'm energized by Dr. Smith's innovative work in childhood PTSD because it strongly resonates with my theoretical approach and is one of my main professional passions. Spending two practicum years working in a battered women's shelter, I've developed a deep commitment to applying more effective single session interventions with this often transient population. This month, I'm completing the data analysis for my dissertation on PTSD among school-aged children of Latinas who've had short stays at shelters. These experiences motivate me to learn the newest evidence-based approaches with this particular demographic, which is an attractive hallmark of your program. 
In the example I just provided, there's a lot of information packed into a short paragraph. It shows you've done your research, that you're up to date in the latest evidence-based PTSD treatments. It tells about your experience, reasons for your interest in an area that their program is known for, that you've done short-term therapy and there's more you want to learn, and it strategically integrates information about the status of your dissertation or project. Another possibility here is to also highlight any relevant paid work experience or certifications. For the closing of your cover letter, it's appropriate to end with a more assertive message that shows your interest in the opportunity. This example is one of many potential ways to convey the genuine enthusiasm that we recommend you demonstrate throughout the process. You might end with something like, given your faculty's unique contributions to advancing evidence-based PTSD treatment strategies, I'm thrilled by the prospect of interning at your site. The complimentary training you offer in developing community partnerships further cements my deep interest in working with you. After talking with several of your past interns about your hands-on mentoring approach, I'm eager to learn more about your program. I welcome the chance for an interview to better assess potential areas of focus for my training at your site, as well as how I can contribute to your program for a mutually rewarding training experience. Applicants often ask if they can disclose too much. The answer is, it depends. But in general, as tempting as it may be to add a lot of personality and uniqueness to a cover letter by using personal disclosures, most people appreciate a cover letter that's serious and professional. Think about the visual you're creating in a reader's mind by the words and examples you use. You're writing a short story about who you are as an emerging psychologist. You want to send the message that you're personable, ready to learn, trainable, and will fit in and enhance their culture. The entire point of the letter is to outline the fit and get the site interested enough to invite you to interview. I'm now going to offer a few brief pointers on recommendation letters. Your references serve several purposes. Not only do they attest to your readiness for the internship training experience, but they provide information about how you're viewed by others, along with your character and personality. References can address your superior skills and attributes, such as how you handle problem solving, working with a team, case conceptualization, client relationships, leadership, ability to get along with others in an academic and social context, ambition, and drive. Importantly, recommendation letters also suggest areas for focus during your internship training, which means your weaknesses and areas of growth. This kind of information is helpful because it demonstrates that even though you're amazing, you're trainable. Recommendation letters are submitted through the standard reference form, which is accessed through the reference portal. You'll enter the names and contact information and your references will receive a link to complete the form. Your references are prompted to answer how they know you and for how long, activities you've performed under their guidance and supervision, your areas of clinical interest, career aspirations and path of development, and your specific competencies and growth areas. How do you get someone to write a recommendation that validates and adds perspective to what you discussed in your cover letter and addresses the key questions in the standardized reference form? Remember, supervisors want you to be successful. They want to help you. Usually, they'll gladly provide a reference, but you can make it a little easier for them if you identify references early, meet with them and let them get to know you over time. Provide a copy of your cover letter, CV, essays, and goals for internship. You may want to consider giving your references a bulleted summary of your work together and to remind them of your specific competencies and accomplishments to help them with their letter writing.
When considering who to ask to write a recommendation letter for you, be sure you always ask the person, do you think you know me well enough to write a strong endorsement? This may feel uncomfortable, but all too often, training directors receive recommendation letters that are vague, suggest mediocre abilities, and end up leaving a bad impression of the applicant. Some applicants wonder if well-known psychologists make better references, but the perceived status of your reference really doesn't matter. What's most important is a reference who has supervised you, can comment in detail about your clinical work, and knows you well. In certain situations, you may want your research mentor to write a letter if it makes sense for the type of site you're applying to. And generally, it's not appropriate to use other healthcare providers in multidisciplinary settings as references unless they've directly supervised your clinical work and there's a compelling reason to use them as a reference. The expectation is that in almost all cases, your references will be licensed psychologists. What helps to create a strong recommendation letter? Specific information, skills, and example. This is used to determine your strengths, which will shape the reviewer's mental image of you. It also helps the site understand what else they need to learn about you in the interview. Context of how the writer knows you. It's ideal if your references know and can comment on you across a variety of settings. This allows the site to conclude how representative and consistent their experience is with you. A strong letter shows that the writer knows you personally. Interactions and observations that are unique to this relationship are more credible than information that could be easily gathered from the CV you've submitted. Points to specific examples of what you've done especially well. For instance, if you wrote a brilliant case study, your reference could discuss the reasons it stood out. Maybe you've done outstanding work in a specialty area the internship focuses on that's worth highlighting. Or your reference could talk about the site and its unique position to help you excel in a particular area in which you show considerable promise. Great references discuss why you would be a strong candidate for a site by outlining how you exemplify the personal qualities or selection criteria valued by the internship program. Calling out particular qualifications can be helpful because this provides specific links between your past performance and what's expected at the site. Recommendations can place you in a larger context. This can include comparisons to others who've succeeded in the same site or similar environments. Quantitative remarks and percentages may be useful, like I found Amy to be among the top 5% of students in my 20 years of teaching. The strongest comparisons have the widest reach. For instance, John is among the best in my X years of teaching is stronger than John is the best in this year's class but really neither of those are bad. Comments about how you've distinguished yourself with a certain population or treatment area are also useful. Drawing on the remarks of colleagues for supporting evidence or the acknowledgement of specific strengths can help. Like, my colleagues and I have often remarked about Jennifer's keen ability to fill in the blank. Recommendations from faculty may also draw on the comments from other practicum staff who may have worked more closely with you but may not be licensed psychologists who provided direct supervision. For instance, a reference could write, the nursing and administrative staff often remark how much they appreciated Jennifer's availability for impromptu consultations. There are, in fact, letters that can hurt you by overemphasizing your weaknesses or identifying too many problems. Let me give you some examples. If letters fail to provide specific examples of your strengths or are too vague, the site will wonder why your reference is withholding detailed information. For instance, saying, Sharita is a great therapist with children, 
may seem positive, but it really doesn't say much. Comments that are generic or obviously reused from another letter for another purpose without regard to the type of site are viewed negatively. Other signs of weak letters merely summarize information that's available elsewhere on your application. They focus too much on the context, such as descriptions of the practicum or its approaches without a focus on you and how you executed those approaches. Letters that largely consist of unsupported praise are simply kind words that don't set you apart. Writing, for instance, Ira is an excellent practicum student, period, lacks sufficient detail to be meaningful. Providing light praise can also send the wrong message because it's not very useful to say that you did what was expected by, for example, completing therapy notes after each session, or that you were punctual, enthusiastic, and never absent. These kinds of comments don't help you stand out. They're general expectations. My intent in reviewing the content of this section was to encourage you to think more strategically about how to use every opportunity in your cover letter and references to explain what you have to offer a site and to explicitly describe how the site can help you. I wish you the very best in your application process. This ends part one of the two part recordings that comprise the internship workshop. Please proceed to part two for the second part of our agenda for this workshop.